Welcome back to another episode of Money Talks. This is Hugh Meyer. Hope you're doing well. Remember, we are connecting thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and business experts to you, the small business owner. Today, super excited to have my guest, Ima Ralph. Ima is the co-founder of a new startup called Pave. She's a three-time founder with over 10 years of experience in building and growing startups in the B2B space. Pave is building a cash flow API to make it easier for fintech developers to connect their data sources and get better insights into their customer earnings and spending habits. Pave has recently raised money from Better Tomorrow Ventures and Bessemer Ventures as well. In this episode, we talk about Ema's background, the genesis of Pave, Ema's 30,000 foot view of the world of fintech, and her advice for founders in general. We hope you enjoy this episode. And remember, please always like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you and take care. Emma, welcome to the Money Talks podcast. How are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. It was great to connect you with you several months back. There's obviously been a lot of activity uh, with respect to you and your startup and excited to hear all about that today. So before we get into that, maybe just give our, our audience a little bit about your background. Yeah, so um, I'm Ima Rof. Um, this is my third company, um, and uh, I'm, I've been lucky enough to start each company with my the same co-founder, who also doubles up as my husband. Um, and so, yeah, people are always like, "How does that work? Like, how do you guys? Do, how is that possible?" But um, yeah, I guess just like a quick anecdote on that, you know, what it's like to work with your spouse. If you're, if anyone out there is wondering. Um, so I, I have this memory of our wedding day. This was during our first company. And as we were trying to get ready for our wedding, we were both like coordinating on that round of financing that we were trying to close and that next customer that we were trying to close. And um, business and personal can definitely get intertwined. And I think, you know, my journey over these last 10 years as an entrepreneur has been really about figuring out how to manage those obsessions a little better, make sure that you know, you're not deprioritizing stuff that's probably more important um, at times and just really figuring out, you know, who I am as who I want to be as an entrepreneur, types of people I want to work with, um, types of investors I want to work with. And the uh, biggest thing has been just like really being both physically and mentally prepared for the type of growth that we want to achieve now with pay. So oh, that, that, That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. You definitely have to, uh, have a, a, a worth a work life balance and I guess even more so when your work uh your your as you said your partner in crime if you will is your is your yeah. spouse so uh but that's amazing well that's amazing it's this this I guess is your third uh third go around so uh, that that's excellent so maybe uh, I guess maybe before we get into talking about pay talk a little bit about kind of the things you had worked on prior to that, and then we can get into kind of what the genesis of PAVE. Yeah, so um, first company we started, we fell backwards into the ad tech space. So we were, you know, building this ads platform um, that ended up attracting every brick and, ma- brick and mortar retailer in the country to kind of test us out and figure out, you know, how to deploy ad spend on Facebook and actually make a return on it. So this was in 2010, this is at a time where everyone still thought of it as like a dating site. <laughs> Um, so we built this platform that basically for every dollar that they would invest, we could return five in revenue. Um, and so that grew super quickly. Um, it was super exciting. I was extremely young and it was like my first time managing people, let alone, you know, building a product and and facing that kind of growth. So learned a tremendous amount through that experience. Um, and it's sort of like, gave me the itch around what's possible with unlocking whole new data sets. Um, and, and I just thought of that as, you know, something that I really wanted to focus my career on. Um, so then that led us to our second company, which was basically focused on building an analytics platform for mobile money operators in Africa. So I wanted to do something totally different from ads, um, you know, still saw this possibility of unlocking new data for, for the good of, of um, you know, building different products. And so it took us to Africa. Um, and I think, you know, while we were there, what we were observing was that um, these mobile money operators were reaching people, um, you know, who had never really had access to right. before. 
right? They had never had access to even basic financial services before. And because they had a phone for the first time, they could all of a sudden use mobile money to send money back home to, to family or pay up, pay their bills through their phone right. or access small loans. And that was just an incredible thing to, to see. And I think, you know, the, the thing that kind of struck us the most was that there were a few companies like Silicon Valley back companies who were able to build these amazing data teams like data science and data engineering teams who kind of figured out how to analyze all this new data about people and then use that data to then offer them lending products or insurance products and so forth. Um, and so what we thought was that, okay, there's like all this new data, whole new populations of people who are ready to access financial services. It can't just be you know, these two or three companies that are able to leverage that. Right. Um, it has to be like thousands of companies that have to emerge from, from all this new data. And so, yeah, I guess that key insight um, we had was that, you know, everyone will have to do the same exact work on the same exact data sources. That's super expensive. It costs millions of dollars. It takes years. You know, that has to be abstracted away. And that was sort of the nugget behind, you know, starting PAVE. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. That's really interesting about your, what you're just talking about with regards to your second startup and the work in, in Africa, because there's so much going on. Uh, you know, as you're, I'm sure you're, you know, right now with, with money movement and what you were just refer talking about with your startup in Africa, there's just a ton of growth and development that's going on there yeah. um, with respect to those kind of platforms. And it seems to have really fast forwarded exponentially. Yeah, exactly. And we just realized that, you know, it's not just emerging markets. It's not just Africa. It's here back home in the U.S., and, you know, sort of why we started PAVE and our, why we're focusing on the U.S. market is, you know, we're, we're seeing the same thing in terms of whole new data sets being unlocked through companies like Plaid, through all of these new banking as a service platforms, payroll APIs. And at the same time, we're seeing like thousands of new amazing fintechs. And it's going to be tens of thousands, in my opinion, just <laughs> whole sets of use cases and communities we can't even fathom. To an extent of you know different ways and different needs people have around money right um, and so you know i think there's a real need there to connect all this data to those end use cases that can really service people and abstract away a lot of the the redundant work that you know every company should not have to do from scratch over and over and over again 100%. That's a, that's a really excellent point. So then that all led to, to what you're working on now through start with PAVE. So maybe um, unpack and pick up, pull up the hood, if you will, on what you're working on now. Yeah. So the basic premise behind PAVE is that, you know, with all of these new data sources and all these possibilities of helping people, you know, manage their cash flow better and, and everything else, there's a need for, um, you know, what we're building in, in, in what we're calling our cash flow API, which um, the way it works is a developer, a fintech developer can connect their data sources to PAVE. And what they get back is a clean and unified financial profile on their end customers. So things like, you know, what is this person's income sources and income stability? And, you know, what bills and expenses do they have? And what are their spending habits? And what are other indicators of their financial lives changing? And if they can kind of bypass all that work that the first generation fintechs had to pour, you know, millions of dollars in and, and right. years in, and they can just get to those clean insights and that unified financial profile on the individual, then they can rapidly build, you know, all these use cases that we want to see, you know, as consumers, we want self-driving money. We want something to just help us automatically save and invest. And we want, to be able to, um, you know, access better credit products um, or help us pay down debt faster and, and all sorts of, um, you know, different use cases that we're seeing developers really excited about building and building a lot faster. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's really incredible how quickly, and we could talk about this a little bit, but how quickly all this, when I say all this, I meaning this, this world of fintech is just uh, you know, exploding and all these amazing concepts and ideas that are coming to fruition. Um, it seems like, you know, we all want to forget 
what happened last year, but in many cases, it led fire, <laughs> if you yeah. will, to the world of, of fintech and venture, because it's amazing the amount of stories I've had talking to some of my guests who are founders in fintech. And it was like, yeah, we started last year. And then you're hearing, <laughs> you're yeah. hearing about, you know, they're in series A and, and you just, it's like um, the amount of work and time that has come together in, you know, le- basically a year, it would probably have taken five or 10 years, maybe, you know, a decade or so ago that everything has just been accelerated. Exactly. And these are good fires, in my opinion, like right. it's a necessary kind of breaking of the status quo. And, you know, I see all of these companies, you know, all the way from like the chimes and sofis of the right. world, all these new companies that are just starting today is like, little revolts against the system to say, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, different communities do have needs for specific services. You know, I feel like every day I hear some really awesome idea of like a bank designed specifically for the disabled community. Right. Or a bank designed specifically for the LGBT community or essential workers or whatever that is. And, and I think that needs to exist and it will exist. And, you know, the whole ecosystem is coming behind that to figure out, okay, how do we make it truly cheaper and easier and faster for those products to get to market? Yeah, no question. I mean, you're, it's, it, like I said, it's amazing. I'm really fortunate. And thank you for being here to be talking with so many of these founders that are making all this happen. And, you know, it's, it's in the end of the day, it's all about really improving the lives of more people and getting access to more people and doing it more efficiently um, than this kind of old line, you know, these old line traditional finance models that frankly have not worked for, for the majority of people. I mean, we saw that I always use, you know, the process with PPP is, is the example, you know, with last year where how many people, how long did it take, you know, the SBA and the government to, you know, to figure out what was going on and who was getting the money and iron, the irony is it was it was there were fintech companies, fintech banks or neobanks, if you will, that were getting the money to people that really needed it and getting into them more efficiently. So it's it's just that's the microcosm of this. And the the more people really get to know people like yourself and what you're working on, they'll they'll come to understand, you know, how much better their life can be, their businesses can be and more efficient by learning about, you know, the space in general. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Agree with that 100%. So how does, uh, just maybe take us through, I guess, the more about the your process as far as who, how do, how do you know, clients, you know, businesses kind of get connected with with what you're working on and, and kind of get that implemented? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, as, as I mentioned, we, we started the company in the middle of last year and have been working very closely with some pilot customers to kind of build out these key use cases on our API. And, um, you know, w- the approach we want to take and the approach we believe will help us get to the widest adoption is really making it super simple for an individual developer to find some code, code sample that we publish on GitHub of like, here's how you build a, you know, mint in five lines of code, or, you know, here's how you can build a, um, a recommendations engine to help people figure out how to pay down their debt faster. So we're building all of these like use case code examples, and we're going to be publishing them um, on our blog and on GitHub and making it easy for that bottoms up approach of allowing that and developer data scientists to quickly take it off the shelf, you know, t- plug in our API, test it out, and build something super quickly to just kind of show the power of, you know, how much faster things can move if all the complexity around cleaning and transforming and unifying data is is abstracted away with our API. Because that's really what we're focused on. Is you know, there's um, every new data source brings a new form of complexity. If you think right. about like bank transaction data. You know, that in itself is just a huge mess, a right. uh, ton of work to be done to, to make sense of what, what's all in there, you know, where do people spend their money and, and things like that. And so we're doing all the heavy lifting on just like cleaning and translating all this messy financial data into, you know, something that's more meaningful into that financial profile. 
And um, we're building like these, you know, starter applications that people can take and then, you know, customize for their specific audience. And so if you think about, you know, the old world of everyone kind of relying on one score or just like FICO and right. like that, that served some people very well for the last 50 or 100 years. But, <laughs> you know, I think we would all agree that that is not the way of the future. There has to be thousands of scores for thousands of different types of people. And what we're trying to do is make it easy for any developer, any team to build their own proprietary score and get that score to service a specific community because they understand that community really well and they can lend to them. They can offer insurance products and, and things like that, if that makes sense. No, 100%. I mean, it's really amazing how many different people and, and, and businesses and data sets you're going to be able to potentially touch with what you've, what you've built. I mean, it just seems like, it seems almost like you're going down the, the rabbit hole, if you will, just because there's so many directions and businesses that you can impact, um, you know, with what you've built. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of the joy of being an API company. I think, you know, we get to be in that infrastructure layer. It's sort of invisible, but at the same time, super necessary to, you know, build that end use case. And I think I, I, think I like being there because it allows you to really see what's possible, um, you know, from a, a more kind of distant point of view of, you know, you're not the one that's actually servicing that end consumer, but you're empowering others to do so. And right. so I really like being in that position. Yeah, no question. And, and obviously, you know, the last year, we all like to, to, to forget about it if we can. I guess, how, what were some of the challenges of, you know, putting all this together, you know, considering last year when it seemed like the world may have stopped there for a minute uh, and there was obviously a lot of difficulty in, in different areas of, of life. How are you able to, you know, overcome all that? And what are some of the challenges that kind of you were confronted with as you were putting all this together? Yeah. Um, so over the summer of last year in, in particular, I think that was the most uncertain time for, for everyone. And I think it was the first time we had to figure out how to fundraise completely, right. you know, virtually over Zoom um, and re really be able to build that relationship and connection with these investors that we wanted to figure out how to work with. And so we kind of had to change how we worked, like, you know, where you could previously rely on in-person meetings and all that, like we had to translate that into really, um, you know, detailed writing, if I can put it that way, like we had to basically bear our soul in, in words and right. so anyone could just like read what we're about, why we're starting this, what the problem is, you know, how we're thinking about the solution and all that stuff from our own words, because you just can't translate that as well over video. And so right. I think it was, it was ultimately good because it got us in the habit of communicating better in writing. And I think that's really helped us with communication with the team because we're all remote right now right. as well. And um, I think it's just allowed people to kind of take their time and, and dig a little deeper into different parts of the business, um, you know, without that in-person conversation, I guess. No, that's a, thank you for that. That's a really interesting perspective. Not, not one that um, I've heard necessarily from other, from other groups and other founders that, you know, have these similar timelines as far as a lot of them, which started, you know, a year ago. Um, but that, that's really, I mean, I'm sure that will serve you serve you very well that you had to had to kind of adapt in that way um and and learn to potentially you know communicate differently and and really help um, i'm sure that's going to be very beneficial and helpful to your entire team um as you move forward because you know we don't we don't know what obviously the future holds but the ability to adapt and work under such extreme environments like we all had to a year ago you know at, at this point um you know you can overcome anything yeah, yeah, I do feel that. And I think one of the things that was really um, surprising to me was how much more open people were to, to just meeting because you know, it wasn't this in-person thing and then you could just meet over video and all that. And so in a very short amount of time over that summer, when before we had built the product, we were able to get like 50 meetings with you know potential customers to do wow. our development and rapidly like get to truth of like what's truly their pain point and is what we're solving going to help them? Is there a wedge here? 
And to, and to be able to do like rapid customer development in a matter of like two or three months with 50 companies and talk to people from like founders to like PMs and data scientists, like that was amazing. Like having a couple of meetings a day, just being able to, um, you know, get to that truth. I, I think uh, just accelerated things for us a lot. Yeah, no, I love that. Get to that truth. I mean, that, that, that really says it all. Um, you know, and you, and again, it's, it's, it's kudos to you guys. It's amazing how much you've been able to accomplish in such a short period of time. Um, you know, I guess there, there was, a, there was, a, you know, last year's events were unfortunate, but it really forced everyone to really create efficiencies yeah. in their business, in their business models that they didn't really necessarily budget or forecast or model, but yet it, you know, it's really helped if they learn to absorb that and build off that leverage it, it's really helped their business. Yeah, definitely. I've seen that, seen that a lot with other, other founders and entrepreneurs for sure. Yeah, no question. So maybe just for a few minutes, what's your kind of, I guess your 30,000 foot view of the world, I guess, of world of FinTech in general. Um, I mean, a lot has happened in a very short period of time. People still have to, in the majority of the public really, if you said that word fintech, they wouldn't know what you were talking about necessarily. But yet, it's if you if you're inside of it all, it's it's an amazing world, so to speak. What's I guess what's kind of your view of it now, and kind of where do you see this, you know, maybe going? I say in the in the future, and the future could be <laughs> at this rate could be six months to a year yeah. from now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, and I think it's okay if most people never hear, hear the word fintech. But I think what what I'm most excited about is, you know, all this, all these amazing founders of all sorts of backgrounds being able to start a bank or a financial service with, you know, small teams and and not that much money. I think that's going to a lot unlock a ton of innovation. It already is, um, as well as you know these sort of fintech first marketplaces and consumer brands and SaaS companies that are rethinking what's possible if you make money, uh, you know, easier. So helping people pay in installments or um, offering, you know, um, working capital when people need it and and all all sorts of things like that. I think when I think about the landscape, I guess, and, and, you know, the broader horizon of things, I, I think you probably get a sense of this already. Like, I just truly think it's unbounded. Like, you know, making money work for people and making it easier. It's just, I I don't think you can put a number on it. And what, what I love about the opportunity right now so much is that it's not a zero sum game where if some company, some founder, some fintech is doing really well, whether it's consumer infrastructure or whatever, like that's good for all of us. I'm truly rooting for everyone to win because I think every time somebody wins, that's, proving out more opportunity. It's proving out that these markets do exist. They can grow. And um, I think, you know, obviously I believe that we're just scratching the surface, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great perspective. I, I I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more just from these conversations I've had with, with other FinTech founders in the last six months or so who are all, you know, working on different pieces of all this, whether well, like, you know, it's banking um, money movement, um, what you guys are working on. It's just, it's, it's amazing. And, and they're all, you know, they all, obviously they all have that entrepreneurial spirit or they wouldn't be doing this, but, you know, they just have this really great energy and they all want to make some kind of positive change, um, on, on onto other people and, and, and open up and create access to to others as well that, clearly have been prevented that access just because of this system that this, you know, financial system that if you will, that's so institutionalized right. and, and clearly, you know, the, the walls of that, if you will, are, are slowly kind of coming down um, as more fintechs are being funded and cre- you know, like yourselves and creating great solutions. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. So, um, I, like I said to you off camera, I always like to give my guests, excuse me, a chance to uh, to take the mic away from me and ask me a question because they spend so much time answering mine. So uh, the floor the floor is yours. 
Yeah. So I guess, you know, I'm so curious. There, there's obviously a lot of work that goes behind the podcast, um, stuff that we don't see. Um, I can't even imagine you know, <laughs> what you have to do to get all this together and get all these amazing people um, that you get to interview. And I'm wondering, like, what what's one of the harder things that we don't see in putting this podcast together? Great question. Um, definitely one of the most the ch- most challenging parts of all this is how best to repurpose the, you know, all this content. If, if there was, you know, I was very fortunate a year, just about a year ago when I was starting this to have connected with someone in the investment world who's pretty well known and, and has a, has an, has an amazing podcast and he's very, just a very generous person. And I was able to, you know, have a zoom meeting with him for an hour. And I just, laid it out for him as far as what my goals were, what I was trying to accomplish. And, and, and the one thing was just about being consistent and, but yeah, having all this content, I want to make the best use out of it for as many people. That's the challenge. Cause I'm always questioning myself as far as, am I doing, am I getting the most out of, you know, my guests are spending this quality time with me and I get these 30 minute segments, 45 minutes. And there's so much, inside of that to unpack and to try to put together for people so that it means something to them. So it's something that, that they can understand and get the most out of. So that's definitely the challenge. Um, I mean, it's a great problem to have as far as trying to figure out what to do with all the content, um, you know, creating clips and, and, and quote and getting quotes from it. And I write um, a, a blog or newsletter on every episode, which I send out, you know, some people rather read as opposed to watch a video. So, but I'm always questioning, how, you know, it, are people getting the best out of what I'm trying to, you know, put together? So that's right. the biggest challenge. Especially because people, you know, resonate with stuff in so many different ways. Sometimes it's maybe that snippet that gets them to to listen to a full episode or like you were saying, a post that they can read and ingest and internalize and, um, yeah, that's interesting. Like every interview you do can be disseminated in so many different ways. Yes. Yeah, and it, and and I, you know, and some of it obviously is very can be technical, can be very high level, and and like we were saying a couple minutes ago, you know, the world of fintech is still, you know, unless you've been inside of it and are building and developing in it, you're, you're outside of it, you don't completely understand what it is and how it impacts you. So I like to try to figure out how do I, you know, create, create pieces of content that people will, they'll, they can understand and then not only understand, but hopefully use, cause that's, yeah. you know, the genesis of, of this podcast was to, to deliver actionable advice to, to entrepreneurs and business owners. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it became as it, as I, I always like to rethink what I'm doing. Then it became, well, there's so the, this world just changed from, well, it had been changing, but last year, fast forward it from this analog world into this digital world. Mm-hmm. And if you were a business owner and, and you're now in this world over here, which has basically become fully digitized, you have to understand what that means to you and how can you leverage it to grow your business. So that's why I do what I do right now, which is you know yeah. bring on people that are building these technologies so that other people can understand that they're out there. Mm-hmm. And then how can this help my business? Not like how can this help my business, but I better learn about this because that's where this is all headed. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm, you know, and it's, I'm, I'm fortunate because, you know, I, I don't think I've ever got someone to tell me they didn't want to come on the podcast. So like I, I'm fortunate in that, um, you know, obviously people have to schedule, but, you know, it's, it's people, you know, the, the common thread is they're all great. Everyone's a great person. They're all great people and they all want to help. They're all entrepreneurs. Um, they know it's been a difficult time and they know that maybe there'll be a, a snippet on the podcast that'll really help someone. So it's, it's, it's great to be a part of. Yeah. And definitely me as like a listener to, to many podcasts, like there's always some nugget that can just completely change how I think about something. And 
it's so powerful as somebody who is an entrepreneur or thinking about building something or even just just curious to to change their world with revealing more of this content because you know I love sharing you know the story of how we built stuff and the challenges and how we got through it and all of that and I always hope that it can reach somebody just at the right time I guess Absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's helpful, like in your case, and you, this isn't your first, you know, rodeo, if you will, you've, you've, you've done this, this is your third time. So you have a ton of experience, you know, trying to build, take a startup and build it up and, and all those challenges and, and find, you know, bringing people on to work with you and the financing, there's so much that goes into it. And then obviously, you know, what you had mentioned, you said earlier, you know, making that connection that to someone that, this is a solution, potentially a solution, hopefully for what they need. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, this has been great, really learning about, you know, what you're working on. Excited to obviously keep following you um, and your husband and, and all the best to you guys. So as we're kind of concluding, maybe offer just one last piece of actionable advice to other founders and entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, one thing that I've sort of realized about this whole journey, um, when when you know navigating the idea maze and really figuring out what is it that I want to spend many years on, you know, it could be five, ten, maybe more years. Uh, you know, I think of it, and I think a lot of people under this stuff thinking about it as as a long term thing. Um, really, the first few customers that you end up working with is so important. Like it'll define so much of how the next few years go and how your product is shaped. And I think you really have to be sure that you are going to obsess over that customer <laughs> and that customer really believes in what you're doing and will basically will you into existence. And that you know mutual partnership um, where you can continuously learn from them and also want them to succeed with all of your soul because that's going to be what makes you build a great company. And I think, um, you know, for me, that's what it always comes down to. It's what gets me so excited. And I think it's what gets our whole team excited. And, um, you know, just coming around that idea that, hey, like, if we can really help this, this team, this company, be successful in what we're doing, and what they're doing, um, you know, that that makes it all worth it, right? Like, it, what, it's what makes you want to keep going. And um, so those first few customers, it's, it's really important just to make sure that um, they're the right ones. hundred percent. No, thank you for that. That was really a, a fantastic piece of advice um, to all founders and anyone who, owned, you know, who's starting up a business Yeah. to really, uh, those are great. It's a great piece of advice. Really take that to heart and, you know, do your, and obviously do your best to, to really help shape and build that relationship. Because like you said, that really will, will propel your business hopefully going forward. So yeah. thank you for that. So Ema, thank you again. It was really, I'm so glad we were able to connect and, and, and meet and talk more about what you're working on. I'm really excited to, you know, obviously stay on top of, you know, your, your, the growth and the progress of your startup at PAVE and uh, you know, let's definitely keep in touch. Yeah. Likewise. This has been so much fun and thank you so much for, for taking the time. Yeah, no, it was it was really wonderful to connect with you finally, and uh, look forward to uh, maybe we'll look forward to doing it again sometime. So I wanted to wish you all the best going forward, and um, just remind everyone we'll be back next week with another episode of Money Talks. Please feel like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and we'll be back again next week. My name is Hugh Meyer, and this is Money Talks. Take care. <laughs>